All right. Welcome to, uh, to my keynote, everyone. It's always really embarrassing to go on stage right after Bruno. I mean, if you got champagne from him, you'll get bathtub gin from me. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it worthwhile. Um, this is, um, while Bruno is talking about the present and the future as well as the past, I will dwell on the past and uh, reminisce about the 20 years of Java that we had and how we ended up in this place where we are today. Because 20 years is significant time. It's a long part of anyone's life. And um, I've been with Java since the beginning, and I remember what computers were like and what the world was like when, when this started. So it's been quite an amazing journey, which is the topic of that keynote. Historical perspectives, by the way, here is some floating point code for the x87 coprocessor. And Intel just now, 2015, shipping an architecture that isn't backwards compatible with that. So the world is moving slowly along with the backwards compatibility, but it's also good it exists. So, um, I don't really need a safe harbor statement from my old employer. This is the place we would have a legal slide if I was still working from Oracle. But I still want to say that this is a highly uh, personalized account of the 20 years of Java history that I've lived through. So, as I say on Twitter, my tweets are my own. And if you uh, want to communicate with me, you can also find me on Twitter and uh, exchange ideas and communication there. So, this is my story, my experiences my life in Java and runtimes and JVMs and other people's uh, and official versions of events may vary uh, a little to a lot depending on who you ask about Java history. So I will, I've been working and, and I'll tell you my story along with this presentation as part of an introduction. I stole some of this material yesterday when I was deep diving into JVM internals so some might be familiar for those who were there but hopefully there's going to be some more showmanship and less uh, ones and zeros today. So I used to work at uh, a startup called Field Virtual Machines, who did the JROC at JVM in Stockholm, Sweden. I was acquired by BEA, used to work in middleware and performance, on Java code generations and compilers. I used to work for Oracle, um, Oracle acquired Sun. I went the way that a few startups had a few adventures during the years, uh, spent four years in the language team doing Java 8 and Invoke Dynamics, the Invoke Dynamic and Dynamic Languages on the runtime, and uh, the Nashorn project, the JavaScript runtime that uh, is gets shipped out with 8. And um, after having finished that, since a few months ago, I work as a senior software architect, whatever that means, in the uh, financial trading or payment business in Stockholm at a company called Klarna, and we're hiring. Um, we're hiring Ukrainians, Russians, anyone inside or outside the EU. So if you're interested in working with uh, uh, large distributed systems and financial technology, check out our open positions. So I'm basically just going to stand here for an hour and talk about what I've been doing for my life for the past 20 years. So, so it's going to be a, a weird experience to me, but hopefully it's going to be informative as well. I'm not sure how... Uh, how much you can see of this picture, but this is like the official Sun Oracle history of Java, uh, starting at the time access sometime in 1995, going all the way up to, well, today, 2015. And these little things here are milestones that have happened along the way. The different JDKs, when Hotspot came out, uh, I'll make the slides available so it's easier to read. But there's been a large, of small, large number of small and large events during these 20 years. And hardware has changed completely. The way we think about programming has changed completely. We've seen paradigm shifts. We've seen streams and dynamic functional programming, dynamic languages come uh, and take up another position than they always had. Um, we've seen hardware uh, be invented and deprecated. So we'll look a little bit into history. How many ever played with the Sun Java station in here, by the way? Uh, I see a few hats, but uh, I'm probably very old. I'm older than Bruno. Um, we're going to be nostalgic, look at things like applets, which was predicted to be the huge Java use case from the beginning, people writing web pages in Java, as the terminology was. Um, lots, not many applets around. <coughs> so it's 2015 today, or nearing the end of 2015, and Java has been around for more than 20 years. Uh, I was at Java 1 two weeks ago, and there was a large celebration. The uh, event was dedicated to... Uh, 20 years of Java, and there were many 20 years of Java talks, so I wanted to do my own. And it's actually been around a little bit longer if you count the alphas and the betas of Java 1.0. Uh, I think I started hacking Java uh, at the end of 95 when I first got the alphas. So, my engineer's perspective, basically. And for me, it started in a consulting company in Stockholm called Appeal Virtual Machines. 
um, where we did Java consulting. We were very early out in the uh, uh, Java business. C++ and Java were what you could pick then. Uh, you didn't have all these fairly fast dynamic languages. There was no V8 runtime for JavaScript. Uh, there were no app servers. Um, it, there was no Rust language or fancy stuff like that. You wrote your enterprise projects in C++ or you started to write them in Java. Then uh, I worked for BEA with app servers because they acquired our company once we started solving customer performance problems by implementing our own JVM. And then I was acquired by Oracle and Oracle acquired Sun and I've been in all these places off and on in the last 20 years. So Oracle is, is where Java is right now and people have had mixed political feelings of how Java is stewarded by Oracle but at least Oracle has shipped Java versions and uh, is investing in Java and things are happening uh, because Sun at the uh, time just before the acquisition in 2010 uh, didn't seem much like a fun place to be. So I'm very happy that Java was uh, rescued and got vibrant again. I also wrote a book on the JRocket JVM, which was what we used for Oracle and what uh, a lot of technology that we're moving into hotspots like low latency GC, mission control and things like that come from. So if you're interested in JVMs, I can recommend that. But without further ado, let's step back to the beginning and take the time machine um, back to 1995, the birth of Java, or the, the, the release of Java, I should say, it started earlier. So, uh, time travel effects. Of course, we traveled a little bit too far. We ended up in 1984, and that's, that's a significant year, at least for me. This is my personal presentation, because that's when, when uh, a boy, a nine-year-old boy, got a Commodore 64 and got introduced to computers. And that was interesting, the Commodore 64, because I realized that when I wrote programs in BASIC on that machine, there was something below the basic that got a lot faster. I saw my first virtualization layer, an interpreter that took basic and turned it into 6502 machine code. And I gradually reverse engineered my way how to do machine code in that machine for speed and effects. So I, I think that my fascination with runtimes that I've worked with over the years and virtual machines they, dates back to this. And, uh, not sure how many people here are from the old C64 crowd. We're on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain for C64s to have appeared in every home in 1984, which is a tragedy, but, uh, but this machine really, really birthed me as a cute computer scientist. Uh, so anyway, side note, let's travel back in time then and stop at 91, 93. I was in uh, high school or something like that, and uh, there was a project called Green, Project Green at Sun Microsystems which is one of the things that Gosling wanted to work on. And um, it was started out as a portable architecture for home electronics. Things like powering remote controls uh, were original use cases. And this was before it turned into a programming language uh, that we used in any kind of enterprise environment or even a client environment. And um, what were machines and computers like at that time? Um, so 94, I'm still at university, and I found some stuff I built then. I had scraped together enough money from teaching computer science classes to build like the highest performance minute tower PC that I could get my hands on. And um, it was a Pentium 90 in it, and I remember having to pay extra to like get to buy the 486 uh, processor at that time. And I'm like, wow, 90 megahertz CPU frequencies are like the FM band these days. Where will it end? And this was, I mean, this was 21 years ago. So Moore's law is pretty astonishing, even though Moore's law has turned more multi-core lately, but I'm getting to that as well. So I'm pretty young. Um, and at the same time in Santa Clara, um, the Project Green birthed a programming language for these utilities, these embedded utilities called Oak originally, I think because Gosling had an Oak outside his office that he liked. Uh, and. Um, he used it for programming. It was basically the precursor of Java, or would turn into Java. And, and Oak had a lot better applications, they realized, than just programming remote controls. And Sun was looking for new business models at the time. Um, they were, among other things, finalizing a deal with Netscape, who was the predominant web browser, uh, to ship applets, to ship a Java engine running in the web browser. And um, things like JavaScript were being uh, written in two weeks, which still affects us. in, in um, maybe not so beautiful ways, but I mean, this is, this is 21 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long, long time. And the right ones run anywhere thing was the, was the 
thing that first started to sell Java. It's not a new computer science idea, but they realized it had potential. And Java started out uh, using the web browser at the platform uh, to be shipped to, to everyone everywhere. And it was also touted as, and I've looked at marketing material from like mid-90s as something called a network aware language. And I mean, what the hell is that? You can open sockets in, in C on the Unix machine, but they said we had like APIs for HTTP pages, so people will use this. So it will be the internet language. And ridiculous as that might have sounded, it was actually true, because as you have to remember, C++, Java, 1995. So um, I was like on Usenet these days, because that's where you got your, um, your news. There were no search engines. Um, there was, I mean, there was a World Wide Web, but it was very, very sparsely populated. And uh, you weren't afraid posting stuff with your real email address on Usenet because no one would like spam you and choke your mailbox out. That was a beautiful period of time. And um, 95 was the year when the internet and World Wide Web suddenly started being used interchangeably. Um, when everyone said, Internet. They meant the World Wide Web because that's the user interface that people saw. And just in time for this, uh, we had Java in the web browser. Uh, JDK 1.2 was released in 96. I think it was early 96. I can be wrong. I was working at uh, Ericsson in Stockholm as a research intern with Java during that spring. And I had Java. It might have been Office, might have been 1.0. But anyway, it was integrated in Netscape Navigator the summer of 96. And uh, Netscape Navigator owned the browser market. This was before Internet Explorer. So, so I worked with alphas of JDK 1.0 at Ericsson uh, 19 years ago at their media lab. And what I remember specifically was that I copied the JDK a lot to move it around because bandwidth was scarce when I was at home with my modem. And the JDK 1.0 fit on one of these. How many in the crowd has touched one of these things, one of these real save icons? Okay, about 80% um, of the crowd. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, so the JDK was less than 1.5 megs to fit on one of these. So I used sneaker net a lot, running back and forth to the university because I like, didn't have time to upload this on my, my 44 kilobaud modem and, and also at the office. And uh, people started to see, like, look at these amazing effects. That's what the general public saw on the web, like this, this cute little animation, these bubble things. So there were sites like Gamelon, uh, Gamelon that, that basically were collections of applets and people thought that look at the waving duke that's amazing what I mean that this is the best we've seen ever and people would write their web pages this was the set like people were using the flash tag a lot in HTML1 at this time and, and now when applets came it sort of made things worse so for the general public I don't think Java had much awareness yet so I, I did an internship at Ericsson's media lab uh, which was modeled after MIT's Media Lab, I guess, guess, which had like the charter to play with Ericsson, the telecom company's future in, in the area of broadband. So uh, our group was tasked with doing cutting edge, te cutting edge technology to, use, like, to do something with media on demand. And uh, we did a music on demand system where you had like lots of artists indexed and you could like do playlists and pull around. Uh, albums and look at album covers and um, share playlists called Mozart. Um, Mozart was basically Spotify and we added some movies as well. So it was basically Netflix too in an applet running in Netscape 202. And the things, the things I had to do to make this huge applet work in like the beta environment of Netscape 2.2, which also spawned a new web browser every time you spawned a thread, and like adding double buffering and writing native code, going back to demo hacking on C64 techniques not to make things flicker, I pretty much reversed engineered Java on the client side and back to make this run in the web browser. So I was a bit before my time, but I also had a, got a lot of fascination for runtimes back at this time. And for, for the fast parts, for the encodings, which CPUs, of course, were nowhere near possible to, to do at that time, we used MPEG hardware cards for streaming music and video. So that was cool. Uh, a little bit early, maybe. So Java 1.0 was out in 96. If you look at the virtual machine, all it did was interpret bytecode. There was no just-in-time compiler in there. And I had this Estonian university professor who was suddenly really proud of his interpreted toy language, not ashamed of it previously because he had the time to write a JIT. Because, I mean, if Java is interpreted and gets away with it and gets this, like, public eye, I can also get away with it. It's probably a good thing to be interpreted, but, but did it. Um, 
there were also several flaws in the original Java. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much you're into the Java memory model, but I've been forced to understand it and forget about it more times than I could imagine. The original Java memory model they put in the original JVM was hopelessly broken. Um, they also had other problems. I mean, there's a lot of deprecation in Java, which is a topic that a lot of people in my own language team like to, to expunge on endlessly, but uh, things like thread stop that were inherently unsafe were added to the Java language, and they were immediately deprecated in the next uh, Java build, uh, or Java version, uh, but I've seen code written as late as 2009, new code that uses these deprecated methods. So, I mean, backwards compatibility is part of the reason that Java is so great and still used today, but it's also an expensive price to pay, right? So, all in all, Java 1.0 was very 1.0, and I was quite impressed how far it got and how wide it spread, even though it was being so early. So Gosling said at, at this time, your development cycle with Java is much faster because Java is interpreted. The compile link load test crash debug cycle is obsolete. I'm not really sure what that means, but it's, it seems like the same argument the JavaScript kid is used today to re-implement everything in JavaScript. But anyway, I had a point in that it was very much faster to do program development in Java because you had memory management and buffer over on protection. But the runtime wasn't that fast. I mean, compile C++ beat it hands down at this day. So we founded a consulting company in Stockholm um, alongside university studies, and all members had extensive Java experience because we'd all been on projects with Java from the start. Uh, so we did a lot of Java consulting because we like programming in Java too because of how quickly it, it, it ran. And, and we had a side business that we should be very quiet about with UML and rational unified process and things like that that people were willing to pay for and we were willing to sell ourselves for, but mostly we tried to do Java. So looking at our web 1.0 homepage in the Wayback Machine, it looks pretty primitive today. Uh, we had a sense of humor. I'm not sure how many seen the 1995 movie The Net with Sandra Bullock, but you can notice there's the pie icon there in the uh, uh, lower corner, which is a homage to that movie, because all web pages have back doors if you click on the pie in that movie. So this is the public awareness of the World Wide Web in 95, 96 again. So if you click to that, you get up a like, really ugly rotating applet with the company name saying you didn't say the magic word. So like strong sense of professionalism in that, in, in that company at that time towards our customers. Um, but what we noticed is that the job on the client, it wasn't really taken off. We did a couple of Apple jobs for customers, but Apple looked different in different web browsers. They were buggy graphics. It was hard to get like native performance of graphics. Uh, what really was taking off, though, was write once, run anywhere, and, and no buffer overruns, and no pointers, and automatic memory management. Because if anyone had like a million line C++ application, and, and was writing a new system, they were more and more starting to pick Java. And also the JDK library was great, um, and platform independent for development. So for server side, 97 is the year where we seriously started to, seriously started to see this in our business. And this also spawned the dawn of application servers, because that's what people sort of wanted to do. They wanted web state, but they wanted a Java server application, because it was easy to maintain. So the prehistoric trail towards Java EE, which wasn't standard yet, starts here. And in the spring, Java 1.1 came out, which was significantly larger than 1.0. Uh, it had inner classes, it had Java Beans, JDBC couplings, RMI, some limited reflection that didn't work at runtime, if I remember correctly. Uh, Symantec released the first Java Jet for their Windows um, Java. And um, according to Brian Gutt's language architect, the biggest historical mistake in Java history is serialization as well, which is another backwards compatibility price that we keep on paying. So this was our last year at university, and there was this competition from a, a Blekinge Technical University in southern Sweden that students could win a programming contest and win a trip to Java 1, which was the second Java 1. And, um, these three guys, now a distinguished gentleman like me, um, won the programming contest and got sent to Java 1. They were like three of my colleagues. And uh, we had a lot of performance problems with our customers because the classic jet didn't scale. You open too many threads, you get out of memory errors. Bytecode interpretation was horribly slow compared to C. People wrote native code, calling Java back and forth just to get performance up. They were thread pooling, they were object pooling, they were using every trick in the book just to get Java performance to avoid having to write their applications in C++. So we figured that the JVM has to be faster if it's going to work. And um, Sun Microsystem presents the hotspot virtual machine here. First time ever, Java 197, uh, using ideas from self, the small talk world and research, basically saying this is an adaptive runtime. An adaptive runtime is potentially much more powerful than a static runtime run like a compiled or a static program like a compiled C++ program uh, because it can use 
runtime feedback info, optimize only hot methods, and allocation is typically bumping up a pointer, not running 150 assembly lines of malloc code every time you allocate something new. And if you know what the program is doing, you can adapt everything from garbage collection policies to thread policies, et cetera, et cetera, to the running system and potentially be faster than like, something like C++ would ever be. And this is old, an old, old observation, but no one's done this really commercially before, so we were really excited because it would solve our customer problems. And um, in 98, Sun released Java 1.2, which contains Swing, which was basically an AWT reboot and still didn't look native, so bad news for Java on the client. Uh, strict FP keyword for floating points. So the classic VM got a JIT compiler. It was better than the interpreter. Um, the collections API came in and JDK tripled in size. Um, I measured it at 1520 classes and 59 packages, and that doesn't seem like a lot today, but it didn't fit on a floppy disk anymore. And I still only had a modem at home. So it scaled faster than my bandwidth. So uh, Java 1.98. We paid tax deductibly with consultant fees, I think, to get back to, uh, to Java 1. And Sun had exactly the same hotspot virtual machine presentation as they did the previous year, slide by slide. And, and we can't wait any longer because our customers really need this performance. And we've jury rigged so much this last year, so let's build our own virtual machine. I mean, how hard can it be? So we thought that if we just like, took a few consulting resources and took a few customer hours, we could get, uh, get a virtual machine that was actually adaptive like Hotspot was promised to be up and running in six months or so. And this is, of course, hubris. But it got us started thinking about runtimes a lot, which led to our, my career, at least, and what I've been doing for most of the time. So we decided to productize a narrower domain so that, uh, that we didn't have to implement the whole JVM from scratch. We did a server-side only uh, virtual machine from the beginning. That was our target, that was a customer target, which was headless, just a console log window, no graphics. Uh, we wanted to help early app server vendors and people like that who were our customers get performance and scalability. We implemented everything with a JIT compiler. Uh, we all know a lot about compilers at the time, relatively much, decided, I mean, startup time doesn't matter on the server anyway, which also was like not a, a valid gamble, but we figured that we'll get rid of complexity. In reality, there was a lot more complexity to uh, uh, pretending that compile assembly code is Java bytecode with line numbers and everything, no matter how hard it's optimized, but we did that. And BEA, at the same time, acquires WebLogic, who was one of the first big commercial success uh, app server vendors. And WebLogic, a lot of customers used that, so it became one of the first drivers of the J2E specification as well. At this time, people got Java performance mostly through compiling Java or Java bytecode to C, running GCC on it, building a DLL of the program and executing that and say, look how fast Java is when we do it this way. Okay, load the class, what are you gonna do? Subclass something at runtime, what are you gonna do? Oh, we don't care because our application is fast. So there were a lot of, a lot of products at this time who actually made a lot of money on, on pretty simply just dumbly converting Java to C++, adding memory management code and, and, or, or like simple garbage collection calls or reference counting or whatever, converting it to C or native code and, and, and shipped executables. And the, the license sales were huge for this kind of thing. And we realized that that's not the way to do it. I mean, building a DLL on the fly, if, if you load a class at runtime, that's not what Java is meant to be. And, and if you translate everything and run with a bad C compiler, because GCC was a bad C compiler in 98, and it's like five times faster than Java, we need to fix the problem for real instead. So we started financing development of our own virtual machine, JRocket, which was supposed to be truly adaptive like Hotspot, um, with consultant money, and um, had to start hunting for venture capital because we realized that it was really hard to get someone to fund this when IBM and Sun were giving away virtual machines for free, even though we said we could solve the performance problem. At this time, this was the dot-com era, so uh, VCs understood mail order businesses on the web, and they understood sending advertisements with text messages to cell phones. And if you came with another business idea, it was really hard to explain it. So, uh, bad environment. But eventually, we got a deal with a venture capitalist to actually uh, bet some money in it and sold part of our souls to, to develop a working prototype targeted to very specific customer applications. So we spent a lot of nights reading academic papers. Um, about existing technology, like uh, Jikes RVM, which was Jalapeno back at the time, which is really cool, Meta compiler uh, at that time, YVM. And dot .com, Prime, Java is the fastest growing programming language in the world, 2000 for the first time. And we also uh, heavy into the dot .com bubble. 
Uh, Nasdaq hits 5,000 points just before the tech wreck, and of course Nasdaq is way above 5,000 points now since a few months back, which scares me because the signs uh, are, are there again. Um, but at least business ideas seem to be at some points more solid than they were in the dot-com era. And we realized that if we wanted to sell our product as a virtual machine, as Java, and if people wanted to cooperate with us, like BA and Intel, and fund us, we needed something called a Java license from Sun. Because you can't call yourself Java without a Java license. And these static compilers and things like that would never be able to call themselves Java because they weren't dynamic enough in Java nature. So, Sun has a secret TCK test suite that you have to pass, not available without the license, to prove that you are Java. And to get the Java license, you have to pay Sun money yearly, and you also have to provide something that Sun doesn't to the Java platform. You need some kind of value add, except for IBM, who have a lifetime perpetual license since time immemorial, so it's a bit, bit unfair for the JNM folks, but we had to provide a value add. So what's a value add? Well, we can make JRocket love Sun and vice versa. We even made cakes on that team. Uh, if, if, and we can provide a value add that's, that's superior performance to, to Hotspot, because obviously you're not getting anywhere. Um, and uh, as a young entrepreneur, maybe we could have learned some diplomacy, because for some reason Sun didn't like that. They didn't think that was an acceptable value add. So you're going to do everything we do, but just faster and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's not the value add. Okay, let's, let's do uh, manageability instead, we said. And that was interesting. That was a key moment in, in Java history, because we realized that we had a lot of information in the runtime. We had an object graph from doing garbage collection. We had hot method information. We had assembly code from what we compiled. And, and this was already available for free because the runtime needed it for other things. So we could export it. So this was the beginning of what became the Java X management API, JSR 174, and also the beginning of what's today the Java Flight Recorder product. So just an excuse to get a Java license, we came up with this. And uh, started implementing the first version of the Java Mission Control Console, which was shipped with Java 8 as part of the Sun line. And um, 2000, Hotspot finally was released in the JDK 1.3, codenamed Castrell. But, um, and, and the bundle Hotspot with the JDK. Uh, otherwise, 1.3 was huge. It had like RMI Corba, the most warning prone code in, in the open JDK that still exists. Uh, the Java Sound API, JPDA, JNDI, and things that, that people, I mean, it, it wasn't a big release, but for us it was big because it had the Hotspot virtual machine. Luckily, it was, it was pretty beta, just like our virtual machine at that time, and they went after a much wider market. And we also released the first JRocket virtual machine the first quarter of 2000, which someone on the internet said, yes, it was very 1.0. It was not very uh, uh, stable at all. It solved some problems. For example, it scaled up threads very fast. Instead of using operating system threads or forking off entire processes like the original Java's did on Linux when you started a new thread, we put green threads, like virtual threads of our own, in native threads. And native threads contained M green threads. And that way we could start thousands of threads when like Hotspot could start hundreds at the time. And this actually made us sell some licenses for very simple applications that were data trading apps, that were chat servers and whatever was in the early web then. And uh, we're stupid enough to write this in the year-end financial statement, which the tax office used to, um, to hurt us badly later. But, but we actually got product out in 2000. And for a narrow domain, it actually was, was better, and people bought it. So that, that's, that's, that's quite amazing. Then came 2001, the year of the black monolith. So uh, we started getting some customer traction and uh, decided to break out the virtual machine product business from the consulting company and run both. Um, thanks to a lot of social engineering that I and, uh, and other people did in Silicon Valley, we finally got the first Java license, which made Intel and BEA and vendors talk to us with the manageability value add. The static compiler mindset was still very strong, and it was really hard to sell adaptive runtimes like JRocket and Hotspot as a concept. People wanted to compile the Java code to a C executable especially Intel, who was like one of our financial backers, liked that idea a lot more because they didn't understand the dynamic nature of Java. But BEA with their app server and their classic VM and their patches and thread pooling and native hacks at this time, they wanted performance and scalability yesterday because they were huge in the market. So we decided to focus a lot of our time to help them out and target our JVM so it would work with BEA and start cooperating on the web server benchmarks and things like that. And Intel and BEA started having discussions about our virtual machine, if we should be acquired or not, and how it would work. 
And one of the things Intel said, okay, we'll back this, but then you have to help us um, write JIT compilers for our new chip, the Itanic, uh, sorry, Itanium, which is, um, uh, which Sun for some reason doesn't want to. And this, the Itanium was one of the most particular, spectacular market failures uh, when it comes to CPUs. Uh, but it came out in 2001 and Intel really wanted the square wheel to run. Turns out it is really hard to write compilers for Itanium because there's a lot of hard complexity problems with in-order execution. You have to schedule instructions just so, and it takes time to compile, so it's not ideal for a JIT, but Intel started funding us to spend a significant amount of time doing Itanium JITs. So this ended up with me spending large parts of the later 2001 in San Mateo getting D-Rocket to run on IA64, both natively and in binary translation mode. So that's stuff I have for my sins. That's one of the first IE64 machines. It um, was about 100 decibels. It was under my desk. It was not FCC regulated, so it had a CRT monitor that wobbled whenever it was on. Uh, two months of that. Um, other things that happened in 2001 was that the um, uh, Java community process opened up, and there were Java specification requests, and Java uh, releases were started to be developed by Java specification requests. For instance, uh, one four, uh, which was codenamed Merling, had its own JSR, uh, JSR 59. So some had been a bit closed before, and the code was still closed to the virtual machine and things like that, but the, the JSRs opened up, and people started participating. So in 2002, Merlin one four came out, and I still think it's still running, even though it's long since deprecated in banks all across the world. So backward compatibility again, blessing and a curse. It was the first platform developed under the Java community process. It added asserts, regex, uh, exception cost chaining, NIO, uh, which had to be redone as NIO2 relatively quickly, the logging API, if you're into global singleton, uh, the image IO, uh, XML uh, libraries, and IPv6 support. And on Valentine's Day 2002, BEA acquired us because they wanted us to focus on app server performance on the JVM. And they asked us the question, okay, now we have acquired you, how do we make money? And we found four value adds uh, at the time of BEA and Oracle before we, everyone got folded into the SunTech. So, um, BEA. The first value add was very simple. It was just selling support for Java in a 24-7 way that they sold support for WebLogic. So I'm not even gonna mention it much here, but I mean, that didn't exist in, in, on that service level. So we built the support organization, which also helped the manageability tech because they needed to look into crashed uh, virtual machine instances and things like that. And we implemented BEA standard multi-tier support <laughs> process for this already. And um, we shipped the first management console in 2002 at BEA World in Paris, which was um, the embryo, one aspect of what was to become JSR 174, the Java X management package. So the management console, which enables you to plug into a production JVM and see what the application is doing, uh, its first version got out the door here. Um, gonna do some hard observations here uh, when we're nearing half time. Um, because Moore's law has been tremendous. Um, while I built the Pentium 90, and it was the state of the art university in 94, now we're up to maybe almost gigahertz anyway. But clock rate curves start to flatten out. And a lot of architectures like multi-cores and NUMA and hyper-threading are implemented instead. So we're going from one core, higher, higher clock rate to, to a world where um, implicit parallelism is better or, or is more useful. More cores instead of more clock. So, uh, or parallelism anyway. Java still has explicit threads and um, no concurrency package and no streams and things like that that uh, make it easy to program such an environment, but neither does, does much else. So um, we also find out in, in the Itanium world, as I said, that in-order execution is a bad idea for JITs, and it's really hard to, to implement something that compiles fast for the Itanium. That's not the uh, sole reason it died. It's, uh, it's a bad architecture in many ways, but for all compiler writers, um, IE64 was a very hard problem. And of course, execution time is runtime overhead, it's program runtime, where you want to minimize runtime overhead and you want to um, spend as much time running the program as possible. And usually you can only uh, minimize one at the cost of the other, hence quick sloppy jits towards uh, slow jits that produce good code. Um, and in 2004, 
Java 5 came out, version numbering scheme changed, code named Tiger. Uh, it was actually the biggest Java release so far. I think it doubled again from 1.4. It had generics, it had annotations, it had out of boxing, unboxing, a lot of syntactic sugar that made it easy to program, enums, the var annotation, dot, 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 static imports, and Dougley's uh, concurrent package. So this started to address the parallelism, implicit parallelism, multi core thing. But it was a great release. I mean, this is my favorite release step in the Java cycle, except 7 to 8. Because it made, made the world simpler, it made it easier to program, and of course some of the things inside generics aren't pretty, and they went to great lengths to only modify uh, the Java compiler and the Java language, not the JVM, but in retrospect I think it stood the test of time pretty well. There are artifacts like bridge methods and, and things like that still in the Java from generics, but I mean, I've looked into how C Sharp does it with, with type reification, and it's, um, it's the fuel of nightmares. So, also the Java memory model has been broken from the beginning, gets fixed, and people start formalizing how it should work well. Um, something else that killed the itanium happened here. Uh, AMD uh, wagged the dog by the tail and released the 64-bit version of the x86 with more registers, the x64. So this is the first time in history that small AMD eats Intel's launch completely. It had full backwards compatibility towards IA32. And you or the normal x86 machine. And you've heard me say backwards compatibility a lot during this talk. And this is this one example where it was absolutely life-changing to the to the industry because people used this. They could run their own 32-bit apps without binary translation on the same uh, on the same hardware. They didn't need to write compilers like a new compiler from scratch. They could modify an x86 compiler. I spent five days drinking coffee, adding an X64 backend to the JRocket JIT, and that's what it took, basically. Well, I worked 24 hours a day, but that's what it took. Like the Itanium compiler, it took, took man years to just develop from the beginning. So AMD just came in here and, and ruled the world. And, so, and it also, I mean, the 64 bit machines, just like the Itanium, had exabytes of virtual memory space, which had a lot of potential. So, so IBM or, or Intel were forced to, to release their own copy of this architecture. That must have been really humiliating. Um, during the mid-90s, there were a lot of benchmark wars. There were three large virtual machine vendors that all had customer bases, BEA, Sun, and IBM. And uh, we were competing a lot on benchmarks, like spec JBB and server-side benchmarks, like um, spec J app server and things like that. And uh, we were inventing all kinds of optimizations every day just to like get high scores on these benchmarks. And then, uh, like, um, if it had consequences in the real world, that's fine. I mean, things got better in the real world. But our product management cared about like good benchmark numbers because it was so easy to tie bonuses and promotions and things to that. So we gave them good benchmark numbers, all three of us. And um, very quantifiable management goals to run these benchmarks and make the JVM run them better and better. But the interesting thing was that, to, to a large extent, I would say 80%, this brought all three JVM vendors brought a lot of real-world Java uh, optimizations in the world that actually made Java a competitor in performance to static compiler C++. And we have lists and lists of this. These are things that we have um, invented optimizations for, uh, mostly. But I mean, there's hundreds of these, and uh, there's more in, the, in, in my book and on the internet than in Charlie Hunt's excellent Java performance book. But a lot of the stuff that we implemented, like bottom up to get benchmark scores, turn Java into the server-side platform where it is today. And, and we worked hard, and that was cut through competition, but it's one of my proudest professional achievements to this date, uh, that I was instrumental in helping out building all these JVM optimizations that all the, like, were copied into other JVMs when someone did something good, and eventually ended up uh, as part of the industry standard for running Java fast. And all this from a few semi-synthetic benchmarks. So performance releases, of course, are not always great for stability, but for the great, I mean, support hated us, and, and I know the same the case existed at Sun, but, but uh, for the greater good, a lot, of, a lot of nice stuff happened. A lot of bad stuff happened as well, such as like the XX aggressive flag for hotspot that Sun had, which basically said, try to run the benchmark as long as you can without garbage collecting anything, because then we get a lot of performance. And of course, people like were gripping in the DLL, the JVM DLL, and started using this in production because it looked fast. And then, where does my program break after a few hours? And it ended up on Stack Overflow and um, the way these things do. So not everything is always great, but we, we had a lot of fun with technology and we did a lot of good with technology, mostly. 
Uh, another thing we started developing here was we work with telco and investment banks and wanted to get garbage collection to be more deterministic. It was already concurrent, both machines being able to run mostly along with the uh, Java program, uh, not requiring so many stopping the world faces. But when the world had to be stopped, it might have to be stopped for a long time, hundreds of milliseconds or seconds for like heap compaction or expensive operations like that, or it might be slow, uh, or it might be a short pause. We didn't know. Um, they, so it was really hard to predict the stable quality of service level for Java applications that depended on it, like trading apps or uh, telco apps. And, and we managed to proof of concept this sometime in 2004, 2005 for, for uh, app server-like workloads. And, and we managed to sell this. We actually made a lot of money for BA on, on these garbage collectors. And time moves slowly. Only now, 2015, is there actually a lot of active work being done on the folding these inventions, like translating to what they mean in the modern world, like the G1 collector and the uh, hotspot CMS, and folding them into hotspot. What's happening now? So it's interesting how history repeats itself and, and how long time certain things take. And this will be a commercial product, I think, from Oracle. So we could turn something like this, uh, garbage collection pulses, into something like this. Garbage collection time might be longer, but you could predict, you could specify that none should be bigger than five milliseconds or something like that. And that, that we sold a lot of this and we did a lot of research on this. A lot of it was commercial and secret, but hopefully uh, we can publish something on that now within the GCT with Oracle. Also, I lost my picture. Oh, my JSR 74, uh, the, the management API gets finalized and we started shipping flight recorder where you could actually export information from the running JVM to a flight recorder format which was extremely cheap because I said we only use available data from the runtime already. We shipped a latency analysis tool, which was the first of its kind. Um, JVisual VM didn't have anything of the kind at this time. You could see where application is locked or waiting for I.O. or a network that doesn't spend its time, which is integrated as part of Java Mission Control today. We shipped the memory leak detector, uh, where you could basically explore a heap graph and see which objects are created and not being garbage collected fast enough in real time in an application without interfering with it performance wise. Sadly enough, this has not been possible to port a hotspot yet for various reasons, but this, I mean, people paid money for a JRocket license just to get this tool. So it's pretty amazing what you can do with the runtime because you already had the object graph from the market sweep. So it's half time, I've told most of the story, but it's half time within these uh, 20 years now, 2005. In 2006, uh, the sun starts, to, um, sun starts to get sad. There seems to be some problems in sun. They have done some bad bets uh, on the financial markets, um, where they're going. And um, if you look at them and say, so where's my Java releases? I mean, what's going on? We just hear Java FX. And it gets dark and it gets hard to communicate with them. And mobile phones are everything on sun. And, and it, it, it's a very strange communication vacuum for someone who's not inside the wall. Um, another thing that happens, possibly as a response to this in 2006, is the Apache Harmony project. Uh, IBM and um, others start the Apache Harmony project, Intel, to, to uh, contribute a lot of code. Um, and, and it was sort of perceived as an alternative uh, JDK implementation by Sun. And they wanted a Java license for this, which they didn't get because the field of use restrictions weren't claim compliant with JCP rules, so now political fighting starts to ensue. And I think a lot of this happened, my personal interpretation is because Sun were doing so bad financially and they wanted to like squelch competition. And um, Sun opens up here, the JVM and the JDK sources under GPL v2, which is kind of toxic. And I think that was also a survival move of Sun to, to avoid harmony, but this is my, my personal theories. We ported JRocket run on the Harmony class lips, took about six months. And finally, in the death throes, JDK 6 in December 2006, codenamed Mustang, contained Rhino as a script engine and the JSR, JavaX scripting, uh, JSR 2.3, the compiler API, JDBC 4, and people start discussing dynamic languages for real, which is good. The MLVM mailing list starts, the multi-language VM, how can we implement things like Scala and uh, uh, Erlang and Ruby and JavaScript efficiently on the JVM, can we use the existing bytecodes? So dynamic languages have been trendy on the JVM ever since 95, but they've never been fast. So now a serious discussion starts about how to do 
dynamic languages on the JVM and JRuby. This is probably one of the reasons that this grows. Charlie Nutter and his folks have done a lot of uh, lobbying. So we invoke dynamic JSR, gets born here, and we discuss it. We're on the expert group with Sun and IBM, and uh, we contribute substantially to the spec. And uh, the polyglot.jvm effort, which is what I've done the last four years, uh, is starting to be coordinated. And um, so, so this is something that happens here at the, near the end of Sun as well. And this is another thing that happens to the industry. I still don't understand it. I think it has to do with Google V8 and, and Node.js and everyone being a hipster and not wanting to use types because that might, might help them write stable code. So we, have, we still have to counter the JavaScript revolution or help it out or, I mean, be in that market share. So, and, and the JVM is useful as a polyglot runtime. Another thing that happens is virtualization is becoming trendy in 2006. And um, how much time do I have left? I started about 10 minutes afterwards. I'm going to skip over virtualization pretty quickly. What? 20 minutes. OK, well, then I, then I can continue. So VMware came out as a market leader in virtualization. And people realized how much hardware power, how much raw hardware power is actually in the server machine at this time. And, doesn't need to run just one operating system. Like it takes away a lot of the flexibility. Um, and we realized that the JVM it could be interpreted in the, in the virtual world as just a specialized operating system for running Java. We wrote the linker, took away the operating system, and saw what the JVM needed. And it was actually a very short list. So we decided to build what we wanted to be value at for for BA and Oracle JRocket Virtual Edition, which was a Java operating system that was aimed to remove abstraction layers between the application server and the hardware, because with virtual machines, they provide abstraction, but the cost of abstraction is always levels of complexity. So under the application server, a Java application, you have a JVM, which is an abstraction layer on top of the operating system, which really does a lot more than the JVM, even though it's just running the JVM, which is an abstraction layer on top of the hypervisor, if you're virtualized, which sits on top of the hardware. And I mean, even up in Java land, you have 12 abstraction layers as an app developer. Uh, but at least we wanted to have a straight path between the abstraction layers underneath without exposing this to the user. So we started trying to make a Java OS. That's not a new idea. Azul has done similar things with kernel modification on Linux. There's Cloudius. There's many other, many other products like that. Uh, but we started with, with app server vendors here. And I think we were pretty early. So, we started building a product where we could remove these abstraction layers. We didn't need to do kernel transitions. We could copy I.O. quickly. We could write our own thread implementations that enabled some pretty nifty like garbage collector algorithms that had very low latency. Um, Azul had done similar things. And um, we didn't need to write any device drivers and stuff like that because the hypervisor provided that. So it was a relatively small effort. And, and we were heavily encouraged to do this by the investment banking industry and people who were already running low latency GC. So that was a fun time. Um, 2007, now politics started getting really bad. I'm not sure how many remember this, but Apache formally requested the TCK test suite. Still didn't have a Java license, and the JCP stalled. So the Java community process stalled, and the Bono votes for almost two years. And we had to like, hedge our bets and implement Harmony and spend resources on that. And Sun started threatening BEA, who yet haven't been acquired by Oracle, to take back our Java license just because they could if they wanted to. That's how aggressively they were trying to spell competition and were fighting for their life right now. And there were no language updates for the foreseeable future. It's going to be a long vacuum now until Java 7. So they, these, this is the dark ages. It's really the beginning of the dark ages here. 2008, Oracle acquires, B, Oracle acquires BEA. And uh, we start belonging to Oracle. And um, both good and bad, we had our own code base that was, was pretty clean at this time. We started working closely with Exadata and Oracle server stacks so we could provide Java as an appliance. Did horrors like InfiniBand support for our virtual operating system and things like that. Um, we became the default Oracle JVM. So it was fun to be closed source and be able to run quickly and ha have backing of Oracle. And any, any legal problems with Sun went away for a while because Oracle had more expensive lawyers. Um, one bad thing was that Oracle forced us to move from VMware to Zen for all, all virtual like work because Larry didn't like VMware. So that was the beginning of the end for the like, idea of virtual operating systems for us in the JVM. 15 minutes, thank you. 
So this is dark ages again, very much political vacuum, some financial troubles. We do steady license sales, but we're not really growing market share and no one likes should we bet on Java what's going on. It's very hard to get any information out of Sun from the outside of Sun, even as a JCP member. And then in 2010, Oracle picks up the remains. And um, I mean, there was a lot of outrage and like open source kid is saying Oracle will kill Java. I mean, Sun has been trying to kill Java for six years and they've almost been successful. So how much worse can it be? Like grow up was my, my uh, attitude here, but not everyone agrees. And again, very personal opinion. So. What should we do with two JVM code bases? Should we fuse them into one hot rocket? Um, should we, um, I mean, should we go with the Sun code base? It was politically decided that we should go with the Sun code base because it was open and it had a huge market share compared to our specialized code base. And there were IP issues in our code, Intel had contributed and so on. Um, and we would gradually lift in features to, um, to, to the open JDK and to the closed JDK. So taking over Sun, uh, a lot of us were very disillusioned because Sun had nothing like continuous deployment in 2010. They had nothing like build kits. They, uh, uh, if, in order to build the OpenJDK, you had to sort of look at some wiki page that may or may not be updated and try to get stuff from the internet that may or may not be the right version number to build it. And if you're running Windows, like, tough luck. Uh, and the QA was basically strange Russian harnesses that have been implemented that, that uh, um, they were crunching hundreds of CPU times a night testing different GC flags but when you looked at like what was running they were running a program that never garbage collected because it was some kind of Fortran computation automatically translated to Java. So we took over things like that. It's like, whoa, this is like 95% of the Java market share in the world and they don't know how to build commercial software in 2010. This is bad. So um, they couldn't run hotspot in an IDE because they had all these automated processes. Why would we ever use an IDE? We don't understand this use case, said the remaining Sun engineers. And we were just like, wide open mouth, star mouth staring at these people in 2010. So a lot of people quit when it was decided that we're going to use the Sun methods that were so successful for Sun the last six years. And um, pick up that code base, scrub that code base, clean that code base. Um, I mean, I'm sarcastic here, but I've heard from people inside Sun and they were not, not having fun at this time. So I decided to go away and do a startup. So there's a little pause period here where I'm doing something in the media industry, basically converting XML to other forms of XML and learning Cocoa on the Mac and learning iOS, which are all useful skills, but it's, I mean, it's not, it's not as exciting as like understanding new hardware architectures and placing prefetches in the JIT so that they will work correctly for all two cache sizes. So I got tired after this, after about a year, and maybe what I should be looking for the next thing. Sadly, they didn't seem to make a lot of progress cleaning up Sun's build infrastructure and things like that, but that had started. Um, so I was still doing this in 2011. IBM officially joined the Open JDK, which led to Harmony retiring and some of like, the voting and politics and things were unblocked. It also been at the Oracle acquisition time. Still, there was a lot of problems because there was no Java release since 2006. And uh, I decided in the uh, fall of 2011 to come back, this time to the Java language team, because they, uh, they lured me in with uh, Java 8 and Lambdas and dynamic languages on the VM, and they all sounded like wonderful things. And I didn't even have to touch the hotspot code that much, they said. Of course, I did, but, but not primarily. But that I, I decided, I mean, this is fun. I really like programming languages, and Java 8 is, is going to be great. But the time I signed the contract, they had just managed to release Java 7 according to what Oracle called Plan A, which, which is basically take what we have, release it now instead of waiting for Jigsaw to finish because that was the original plan. So I'm very happy that it wasn't Plan B at this time. And we had the first Invoke Dynamic implementation, compressed oops with default, which gave us performance, product coin with language changes, um, try with resources and stuff like that, new concurrency utilities and IO2. And this was a turning point because this was so well received by the community after all that silence. And I was at Java 1 2010, which was a horrible death march. And I was at Java 1 2011, where everyone was like, wow, Java came out, and there's actually useful features and the things we can see and touch. And James Gosling came back and was at that Java 1. So I was totally energized by that week. It's very hard to explain the difference. I was completely defeated by Java 1 2011 and completely energized 2000, 2010 and energized 2011. So I decided to come back. And looking at the JVM architecture here, we still have backwards compatibility and we will always maintain it from, from the Oracle uh, perspective. Uh, 
in some ways, I mean, Jigsaw would be the first breaking change, but fundamental compatibility would always be there. And without it, I don't think that Java would have survived this, like the weak and strong periods of its time. I was going to demo here, but I'm out of time. I found some binaries for like a mail sorting, a mail statistics program I wrote in 97 for a software project. They run fine on Java 9 build 90. I just tried that yesterday. So backwards compatibility is pretty damn cool. And they do horrible AWT tricks, and they still worked on this Mac. So Java 8 development started, and it got energized again. We started the Nazarene project. We started looking into dynamic languages. We started porting over JRocket stuff to Hotspot, like the serviceability agent, the Java mission control, and we released those with Java 8. And Heroes cleaned up the build and test infrastructure, so you can do configure make on your machine now and build the OpenJDK in five minutes, which Sun hadn't been able to do for 10 years. And that's, I mean, that's healthy workplace again. People got sick from like, trying to build open GDK and it was undeterministic. So it shows how important continuous deployment and test environments are. 2013 was crunch mode in the language team. Java 8 needs to be finished. We stalled half a year. It was a huge security backlog that had been mostly unattended and hidden for a few years. It went away. Hundreds of security problems got fixed. Java 8 got out March. 18 last year was the biggest and best Java release ever. Palm gel removal came from JRocket. Um, type annotations, on-site integer math, um, repeated annotations for EE, date and time API, the Nasun engine, and Cake, and Lambdas, and, and, and the possibility to program with streams and, and, and like implicit parallelism, uh, changing this to a stream or, or, or a parallel stream, and, and shorter code and rapid adoption and a build process that takes five minutes, which is like a huge breakthrough for anyone working on the OpenJDK. So finally, it's 2015. So everything like has good and bad sides. So finish touches on Java 9, Jigsaw. Uh, the official FC was uh, feature complete this December 16. I'm not sure if it will slip or not. We have a J shell, which is really awesome work by Robert Field, who talked about it yesterday. We have partial JavaScript 6, ES6 support with performance improvements in Evoke Dynamic. After 9, we're working on Valhalla with value types, foreign function interfaces to finally kill JNI and abstract it properly, Project Panama, Arrays 2.0, doing something about low latency GC finally, and open source JVM implementations are coming. J9 has opened up or are opening up their VM with a non-toxic GNU license. They've actually successfully used their runtime on, on the JRuby MRI native runtime, and it, and it gives performance. It's like amazing the things that happen to virtual machine technology today. So I would say that there was a long dark period, but Java is vibrant again. People are coming to work on the Java systems and runtimes again. Java 8, I'm really proud of that release. It's the best ever. Um, <clears throat> Java 9 had an awesome Java 1 2015, two weeks ago. Anyone who can should join the JC JCP and have some optimism. And with that, that's the end of my keynote. My journey from um, Pentium 90 land to today. And it's been a long, strange trip. So thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Hit me up in the lounge. Thank you. Otherwise, I'll be hanging in the lounge outside for a bit. Hello? Yes? Um, I have a question, and it turns into a bit of a rant, but I'll start with a question first. Um, your slides mentioned vectorization and the JVM as one of the optimizations that you apparently did. I don't know. Yes. But it's very hard to get information on vectorization support in Java, any Java, any JVM and the Stack Overflow questions just need silence. And does, does JRocket do auto-vectorization? Um, I know that Hotspot does uh, a tiny amount of it, uh, but it's all like very quiet and nobody advertises it. And what's the plan? Is it gonna have more of it? And for the rant portion, it's um, the JVM developers rant on and on about multi-core and it's the future and streams are awesome, but Java now has a ton of ways to do multi-threading. Executor service, reg regular threads, but there's still not one method to do just vectorization. Okay. Even though the performance improvement of that is 
huge, no less than multi-threading. Right, yes. So your question is basically, do the VMs do all vectorization and can you control it explicitly from, from the development layer as well? Because that would give you performance improvements. Is there a JVM that does auto yes. vectorization? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Hotspot does a tiny bit of vectorization. JRocket is pensioned off. It did a tiny bit of vectorization. I'm not familiar with the J9 code pipeline. We had the uh, Sumatra project that was in, like ex experimenting with all these kinds of GPU backends. Uh, and I don't think that's under active development on the OpenJDK lists. So, and, and controlling it explicitly, I don't think so either. I mean, I'm actually. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're right. There is very little information on it, uh, and I agree that there is potential. Please, please give us vectorization. It's the last missing piece for getting C performance from Java. Okay. I'll ask you private. Yes? Pri private. I'll ask you later. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. We have a 15 minute break for the next talk.